So it's time for a reality check, ladies and gentlemen. On the web, we find numerous mentions to billions of years old. We find uh, opinions expressed as to the age of the, the Earth going back 4.55 billion years with a tolerance of 1%. Seven and a half million entries on the internet for a million years old. Uh, three and a half million entries for a billion years old. Laughter, 16 million years old. Figure out how you arrive at that. And then the statement, which is from an engineering point of view, highly provocative, quote, the generally accepted age for the Earth and the rest of the solar system is about 4.55 billion years, plus or minus about 1%. In engineering terms, you would not express that level of certainty if you were interpolating, let alone when you're extrapolating to the tune of 4.5 billion years. How reliable are these figures? What if there was some radical change in the environment that has not been taken into account by the per people who postulate these theories? And they are only theories. I want to suggest for your consideration that extrapolation over millions or billions of years is invalid. To try and make what I'm seeing uh, visible to you, I'd like to suggest it's tantamount to an ant on a railway track claiming to know where the train has come from and how long it took to get there and the route that it followed just by looking at the oncoming train. It's clearly manifestly ridiculous. So I'd like to ask you to take a reality check on your historical theories. Are the theories that you have, that you subscribe to, about the formation of the earth, the formation of the hills and mountains and valleys around you, tantamount to conjuring a rabbit out of a hat or jumping off a high-rise building shouting I can fly and flapping your arms? Or are they solid and robust? Do they stand up to in-depth scrutiny? So what if at some point in the past there was a massive catastrophic event that totally reshaped the surface of the earth? Maybe not that long ago. Would the ants see anything different? Would aging calculations be turned upside down? Is it possible that ancient historical writings might be accurate? A little bit of religious and spiritual background. I grew up in the Church of England or Anglican Church. Uh, in my 20s, I walked away disillusioned with hypocrisy and a bad attitude. I found the church teaching did not fit, was not practical, was illogical, was inconsistent. I was told to believe the book or the Bible, but found that the church ignored the book and that what the church took, taught was in, in contradiction of what was in the book. Close to the age of 40 and the point of death, I had a massive and dramatic encounter with the Almighty where he spoke to me audibly in a way that I suddenly knew with absolute certainty that he existed. Since then, I have had numerous incidents which have given rise to a deep evidentially based conviction that the Almighty Creator exists and is real. In coming to that conclusion, I've applied the engineering approach that I'm advocating in this presentation. I asked lots of questions. I looked for doctrine that would stand and not fall down. I was looking for truth. I obtained many, many answers. Many of those answers do not conform to what the church teaches and is therefore not liked by the church, but that's not my point. I've read the book, the Bible, the Old Testament more than 20 times, the New Testament many more times in numerous translations. I would suggest that I know the Bible better than most people. And I'm totally convinced that my faith and my belief must fit the facts. It must stand up to the most rigorous engineering scrutiny, and I'm sure you would agree with me. I would like to reference a fundamental law of physics. Force equals mass multiplied by acceleration. Any change in state, any movement relative to an apparently static position requires an external force. Disruption of the surface of the earth requires an external force. It cannot happen within a state of equilibrium on the planet. All evidence of dramatic change is also evidence of dramatic forces being applied. Evidence of a vertical up or down thrust of the surface of the earth is evidence of massive forces being applied. The nature of such a displacement is such that the force is almost certainly external. 
I would like to point out to you today, ladies and gentlemen, that we live in an unstable universe. As I was preparing this presentation, I had the privilege of being having access to the NASA website and to a feed which puts up a photograph every day from the NASA um, collection of photographs. Many of those are, are space scenes. And so I'm going to share a few of those which I believe help to make this point. In front of you, you have a picture of a solar flare on the surface of our sun. Notice the scale of that flare relative to the surface of the sun and recognize that as much as the sun looks stable and uniform to us from where we sit on planet Earth, it is in fact not nearly as stable as we would like to think. Another photograph, the sun on the 1st of August 2010. Look at all the instability, look at all the solar flares and all the movements taking place on the surface of the, the sun. Going far beyond our solar system, the Hubble Space Telescope, looking at the birth of stars, the brown glob of stuff in the middle of the picture is actually clouds of gas, uh, three light years high, huge, huge scale. And the bright lights dotted around that picture are all suns, numerous, numerous suns. And what we see there is this huge mass of gaseous and other material moving and shaping constantly. Again, showing just how unstable our universe is. Another example, another NASA photograph, a massive runaway star traveling at 400,000 kilometers per hour, equivalent to traveling from the Earth to the Moon in one hour. And you see scattered around in these clouds of gas and, and, and murk, uh, millions and millions of stars, bigger, many cases bigger than our own star. And so the scale is absolutely huge. And the evidence of instability is mind-boggling. Another example, constellation Cassiopeia, a supernova, a massive explosion, a big red blob in the top left-hand corner of the image. Again, millions of stars. We, we are a micro element of the entire universe. And yet, somehow we, we speculate that we know the full details of what's going on. But the point about the supernova, it's a massive explosion. Again, an unstable universe coming closer to home, only 160 times further than the move. moon, Comet Lulin, described as a dirty snowball, a big glob of ice and gas traveling through space at high speed. Again, notice all the stars in the background. What if one of those hit the Earth or came close to the Earth? And then we find just at the perimeter of our solar system, the Kuiper Belt, massive chunks of ice in space circulating. It's not difficult to postulate one of those being knocked out of its orbit by some space phenomenon and catapulting towards the Earth. Coming closer to home again with Mars, Hellas Planitia, a massive crater, 2,250 kilometers in diameter on the surface of Mars. And I ask you to notice some interesting things. The depth of the crater is limited and the height of the crater walls is also limited. Now, if this had been a solid mass of rock that impacted, I suggest for your consideration the crater would look different. There would either be this big chunk of rock embedded in the surface of Mars or the hole would be much deeper and the material thrown up would have a different characteristic. Stop. Think about it. How did this crater get formed? I suggest for your consideration that it can only have been formed by an ice object which melted as it made impact with the surface of Mars. If we take that crater and superimpose it on southern Africa, it stretches from Cape Town to Lusaka, distance of over 2,000 kilometers. It totally obliterates the entire subcontinent where I've lived my entire life. It's thought-provoking. What if something like that hit the Earth at some time in the past? 
Would it just hit the earth? Or would it do something like knocking the earth out of its orbit, knocking it off its axis, do something else? So we live in an unstable universe. We're faced with massive instability in the environment around us. And the fact that we think we've had approximate instability for the last few thousand years does not mean that we have a basis to extrapolate over millions or billions of years. We see planets or stars or chunks of rock traveling at 400,000 kilometers an hour. We see massive chunks of ice 80 kilometers in diameter and larger. Instant floods are potentially real. We see massive sunspots. We see huge impact craters. Ladies and gentlemen, any assumption of steady state for millions of years is seriously open to question. So what if the crater on Mars was caused by a massive ice block? What if such an ice block hit the Earth? We're looking at 4.47 thousand million cubic meters of water. The Earth's diameter is only 12,700 kilometers. That amount of ice would result in a covering of the Earth of 11.75 kilometers deep. So in actual fact, a global flood could be caused by an ice ob object much smaller than that striking the Earth. A depth of water of 2 kilometers only requires an object of 1,250 kilometers in diameter, or we could see a series of smaller objects. Coming right back to the Earth, we live on an unstable planet. There are currently about 500 active volcanoes around the, the world, as shown in this map from the United States Geological Survey. And it is estimated at one time there were about 20,000 volcanoes. How can we assume steady state for millions of years? I would like to introduce you to Johannesburg, my hometown, built on the gold of the Vodvatisrand of the White Waters Ridge, approximately 1,700 meters above sea level, and the source of much of the information on which this presentation builds its case. My point, ladies and gentlemen, is that I'm going to talk to you based on first-hand experience. This is not theory that I've read in a book. Bits of it, yes, I have read in a book, but I've tested them against the area where I live, and I really, really believe that you will find similar stuff in your area. As a height benchmark, I've chosen to use the Hillbrow Tower, one of the tallest buildings in Johannesburg at 269 meters, uh, quite small compared to the World Trade Center, the Empire State Building, but just a, a benchmark for height and depth uh, for use in this presentation. Contrast that with the Burj Khalifa, in Dubai, which stands at 828 meters, over three times the height of the Hillbrow Tower. And what I would ask you to see that as we look at sedimentary deposits, water-laid rock, that the depth dwarfs the height of these buildings. The magnitude of what we're talking about is considerable. Coming really close to home, Northcliffe, which I see every time I drive home from pretty much any direction. It's a major landmark in Johannesburg. It's visible from the east, the north, and the west of Johannesburg for very many kilometers. It's an extension of the gold-bearing sedimentary rocks that form the gold reef, and as I said, it's within a few kilometers of where I live. It's the pivot point for this presentation because it sums up the argument in one photograph. Northcliffe is made of vitrified quartzite rocks, that sand melted in a furnace effectively. It dips 30 degrees south, and the same geological formation is continued 50 kilometers north in the Machadisberg. Northcliffe is underlain by and upthrust by the halfway house granite dome. Its high point is 1,807 meters above sea level which is at roughly the same level of high points for hundreds of kilometers around. There are no high points higher than this in the vicinity. It overlooks valleys cut down into the granite with material that has been deposited nearly a thousand kilometers away. We have a cliff face with massive boulders, boulders wrenched out. The top of the hill is covered with rough freestanding rocks. As I say, it's a graphic summary 
of this presentation.